Good morning and welcome to the last in our series of The Road to Reopening. I'm absolutely delighted this morning to be joined by the museum chairman, Christopher Haynes, and where more appropriate to be having a conversation with him than in the very new John Haynes exhibition. Chris, my first question has to be, does the, uh, does the exhibition do your father's incredible life justice? Oh, it's a wonderful exhibition. I'm absolutely delighted with it, uh, as are the whole family. What I find fascinating is, having been heavily involved in his biography, which obviously took several months to put together, and then you come into a space like this where you're trying to summarise that entire book into a number of exhibition panels. What a hard task it is to condense it all down. But what I'm really pleased about is how you've managed to grab the essence of so much of Dad and the reason why the museum is here, um, his collection and the purpose of the museum. It's a, it's a wonderful exhibition. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted. Um, I'd like to ask in particular, um, obviously, you know, you know your father and your father incredibly well. Is there anything in the exhibition that you've looked at and you've said, Jay, golly, I really didn't know that about Dad. You'd be surprised if there was something that I found in the exhibition that I didn't realise or know about my father. But the one thing I do love is the fact that we have bits of his um, legacy which are unrelated in many respects to the museum, but that are on display. I draw attention to the, the painting he did as a sort of 16-year-old schoolboy um, with the book that he, he, he won for the Senior Art Prize. And then you've got the briefcase, the legendary briefcase, which to most people, they would look at it and just think, well, that's just an old briefcase. But to the family, that sums up my father in so many different ways. And my brother indeed mentions the briefcase in the memorial service because the briefcase represented so much about my father's character. It was a 21st birthday present given to him by my grandparents, his parents. And he kept that briefcase his entire life. He never replaced it. He didn't see the need. It served its purpose beautifully. But also he had a gentle sentimentality to it because, of course, it was given to him by his parents. And so that sort of loyalty and all those charming um, characteristics that my father was known for is sort of epitomized in that rather tatty, beaten up, briefcase and in fact my brother tells a story of how he offered to buy him a new briefcase and my father just looked at him completely perplexed and said well why would I want a new briefcase I have a briefcase and it's just little things like that that make it really very personal that makes this exhibition charming and, and I think from uh, if I may say from those of us that have the the, uh, the pleasure to work in the museum for us, it's been an incredible learning journey as well, learning about your father. And the one big thing that stood out to me is I didn't realise quite how much of an artist he was. Yeah, I, think, I think John, uh, if I may, was probably thought of as more of a technical mind, but he was one of those rare people who was an artist and a technical man. How fortunate was he to find a career, a career defined by blending his passions of art, cars, publishing. He used to love looking at books, other people's books, totally unrelated to cars. He just used to love it looking at the way that they had been put together and the illustrations and the way in which they created the book. And he got great satisfaction the artistry that went into that. But of course that artistry also is reflected in the cars because it's a car in its essence. It's a car, broom, broom, go fast, enjoy. But actually there's so much art that goes into the car. And I think that also encapsulated very much the things that he really loved. And of course, um, your father has left the nation an incredible legacy. In preparation for this conversation, this interview, I was thinking about the, the rise of the museum. And I was just th thinking about how in the 80s and early 90s, over a 15 year period, um, having floated the company in 79, he started buying cars and he opened the museum with 29 cars. They weren't all his, but there were 29 cars in here. And over the intervening 10 to 12 years, he bought and then gifted to the museum over 450 cars. 450 cars in the space of 10 to 15 years. You do the maths. That's a lot of cars per annum. Auction houses loved him. And of course, 
The stories that go with that are, well, there's many, many stories, but one in particular that I am reminded of was Mike Penn, the curator of the museum for the first 30 years or so, tells a wonderful story about how on a regular basis, my father would take great pleasure in reading through the auction catalogues and he would mark maybe three or four cars from an auction catalog that he was interested in. And it could be for a, a myriad of different reasons. But he would identify those three or four cars and then he would say to Mike, Mike, I would like you to go and research these cars, make sure that they're up to, up to snuff and uh, give me a report back on each of them. So Mike would do his prelim work and then he would go to the auction the day before to view the cars and he'd get on his hands and knees looking underneath, making sure that they're what they're supposed to be. And then my father would turn up the following day for the auction and the cars would come up and my father wouldn't lift his hand. And Mike would be sat there thinking, <laughs> what's going on? And then the next thing he knows, he's buying three completely different cars that just took his fancy. When he walked in and saw them, he thought, actually, that's the car I want. And so the collection that we have here, I can't stress enough how personal it is to his passions and his interest in the car. And there's various news clips where you get an, a, a small insight into the reason why he bought the cars that he bought. Uh, and I think that's one thing that we've tried to do this exhibition as well, is to give the collection context. Because uh, as Chris says, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the collection of cars in the Haynes International Motor Museum are a direct reflection of the passion uh, of, of, of John Haynes and the cars that he liked. And Chris, uh, I know that you equally have a particular passion for heritage engineering and you're very keen um, uh, to support that uh, in the future. There's a very buoyant uh, market for classic vehicles, but it's equally imperative that those vehicles are kept on the road, maintained. And a lot of the skill sets that are required to do that um, through modern engineering are possibly diminishing. And so I think with the museum and the preservation that it's one of its core principles, um, it's an obvious fit that we um, encourage and um, promote, and indeed within our own facility, grow the heritage engineering side of the museum. So that in 50 years time, I'm always talking about the legacy. I'm always talking about 50, 100 years. This isn't like a business. This is a, a charitable institution that's here for all of time, hopefully. So long-term aspirations is to try and create a center of excellence for heritage engineering with apprenticeships and so on and so forth. My very beginning at the museum, um, in my summer holidays, I used to help build the museum. I laid the concrete in this room originally, but I also spent a lot of time working in the workshops. And when you got a car running absolutely sweet with no digital interference, it's just down to fine adjustments on the carburetors or whatever it might be. And it rolls out the door and it just absolutely sings. It's, just, it's a truly wonderful experience. Um, and very much like the whole museum, pers on a personal level, my involvement has been on every aspect of the museum. I think the only thing I haven't done is cooked a meal. In every other respect, I've done pretty much everything here, including clean toilets, serve food, host people in a conference. And, you know, it's, it's, it, the museum is through to my DNA, gifted by my father. As we reopen with all these new exciting exhibitions, with the new um, Red Room reimagined, uh, I hope that the general public will come and really enjoy and engage with the museum um, and appreciate exactly why we're here um, and indeed understand a little bit more about the context of what the collection is all about. Chris, uh, thank you so much for spending time to talk to us. Um, uh, I would re reiterate uh, that we're open uh, as of the 24th. Um, what I'm going to do now, which I didn't think I was going to do, I'm going to take Chris off to the kitchen. I'm going to get him to cook <laughs> me a meal and then he will have ticked off all the lists of the things he's done in the museum. I've learned to make coffee, proper coffee. 
just today on our new machines. Uh, and actually, a, a shameless plug there, uh, Cafe 750 <laughs> has now got fantastic new barista machines, great coffee, uh, and we're just, we are just so looking forward to you coming in through the doors. The museum has been terrible when it's been empty. It's built for people. It's built, built to share that passion, so please, please come and see us.